The thing about churn is there's no one solution. If you think a customer is going to leave, the next question is why? Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to send in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the continual relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Carl Gold. Here are three things you want to know about Carl before we start. He's a chief data scientist at Zora, one of my favorite titles. He's creator of the Subscription Economy Index. And he has a new book coming out in August titled Fighting Churn with Data. Welcome, Carl. Thanks. Hey, I always start the question, how did you get into pricing? But it's probably hard to say that you're in pricing. So uh, how did you get into data science? Yep, that's fair. I'm not really in pricing except my work touches on it in several respects. So how I got into data science, a little bit different than most people. Maybe it speaks to my generation. Uh, I did a PhD in... Well, it was in a department that combined neuroscience and AI and neural networks. And this was all long before neural networks and AI was cool. Well, maybe not that long before, but you know, a good ways before neural networks and AI was cool. And when I finished my PhD, I actually didn't go directly into data science. At the time, there was no such thing as data science. And there weren't that many jobs in machine learning, but there were a few. In the end, I was I interviewed and I got offered a job doing one kind of machine learning. And I also got a job at a finance company uh, offer. And so I actually became a quant directly out of uh, my PhD. And back then that was really the main route for a science PhD who didn't want to stay in academia. So I joined the Wall Street finance industry shortly before the financial crash uh, of 2008. And uh, stayed in the industry for, for many years, around seven years, as really a Wall Street quant and not a data science. But during that time, data science became a thing, AI became popular, and because of my PhD background, which included AI, machine learning, um, statistics, and all that kind of good stuff, it was pretty easy for me to do a lateral career transition and become you know, a data scientist. Yeah, I have to say I'm pretty sad because you know, when I was younger, I was I was a geek, right? I love stats and econometrics and all that stuff, but I left it before data science became cool, right? <laughs> so, so now you're like the cool kid. This is really neat. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good timing. I, I did kind of miss the first wave though, because I, I argue, you know, if I had timed it better, I could have been part of like sort of the first wave of AI and data scientists, but I was actually in the Wall Street world while that was going on. But you know, it was still really great experience working on Wall Street. So I wouldn't change what I did. And, and it's always about uh, trying to model something and figuring out what the, how the world works with data. So. Yeah, no, I see being a quant and a data scientist as really pretty similar. I mean, practically the same in that you're just using science and math to do something, you know, that's economically practical. Um, of course, as a quant, there's a lot of specialization in certain areas of financial theory. And as a data scientist, you've got a more emphasis on machine learning, uh, arguably, although a lot of machine learning is, you know, finding uses on Wall Street now, too. So, yeah. So what do you mean when you say machine learning and how that's different from uh, data science? Or oh, no, I don't mean it's different. I mean, machine learning is, of course, a big part of data science. It's less a part of being a Wall Street quant was what I meant. Okay. So machine learning me, to me, it means, I guess, different things to different people. But, you know, it's any predictive algorithm that learns from the data, um, except you're kind of excluding uh, classical statistics like regression. Um, and then you get into kind of these edge cases and you're like, oh, is ridge regression, you know, <laughs> statistics right. or machine learning? <laughs> you know? Right. But it's all kind of semantics. Got it. Got it. Okay. Let's, let's talk about a couple of things that you've done recently because I'm fascinated by both of them. Uh, one is the subscription economy index. We talk a ton about subscriptions and pricing subscriptions uh, here on our podcast. So tell us what the index is and, uh, and how companies use it. 
Sure. First, I'd better back up and tell uh, your listeners what Zora is. Uh, Zora is a software platform for running a subscription business. So if you've got a subscription business, you're going to have pricing plans and products. Um, Zora lets you manage your pricing plans and products and, of course, your subscribers, your customers. Uh, it generates people's invoices and talks to your financial system. So, so Zora runs a lot of uh, subscription businesses. Uh, some so that, so can, I, can I think of it like an ERP for subscription companies? Uh, he, and kind of, but not exactly. I mean, Zora has this model that they call like a, a three cloud model where you have your CRM on the one hand, um, and then you've also probably got an ERP and Zora sees itself, I should say CRM is your customer relationship management. Um, and then Zora kind of sits in the middle is, is how they see it. Um, so yeah. the ERP doesn't really go away, but you've got, because instead of selling products, you know, one at a time through your channels, you have to maintain this relationship with your customer over time. Zora maintains that relationship. Um, particularly yeah. focusing on the financials of that relationship. Yeah. So would it, would it be fair to say probably the biggest challenge the companies that are going subscription face in this aspect that we're talking about is the billing and the fact that I now have frequent billing and different, and I bill on different aspects and right, it's yes. just this big challenge that companies face. Yeah. It's the, it's the challenge of having a, a, a let's just say an in, if you have an interesting pricing plan, uh, then it's a challenge. And it, see, if you're billing everyone $9.99 a month, that's not much of a challenge to get everyone's bills right. But as soon as you go into like a good, better, best plan, maybe you're giving temporary discounts, uh, suddenly things are very complicated. And it, it's really hard just to get everyone's bills right. And then you can add uh, pay-as-you-go pricing, which we call you know, usage pricing or usage-based yep. pricing. And yeah, it's, it's hard to get everyone's bills straight and uh, very quickly. And, and Zora lets any company define a complex pricing plan with like a good, better, best level, discounts, add-ons, and, and still get everyone's bills right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so that seems like a really important thing to get right. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I mean, if you can't bill people correctly, then you know, what's your pricing plan good for? Exactly. But so I want to bring it back to the subscription economy index because that's Please. the question we started out with. <laughs> <laughs> so Zora has data about a lot of amazing companies that are, you know, leaders in the, the subscription world right now. And the subscription economy index takes the data that's generated on the Zora platform and completely anonymizes it, I should add. So we're not looking directly at any company's data. So the data is anonymized and aggregated to make benchmark metrics for the subscription economy. Um, and so one of the most important metrics that we track is the average revenue growth rate of companies. Um, and that's what the subscription economy index itself is, is a name for. It's an index which tracks the average sales growth of the companies on the Zora platform. Um, yeah. And, and so when I first saw that, I, you know, you probably do the exact same thing I do. And that is every time I see a metric or an index, I say, okay, does that make sense? Are they cheating? Is it biased? Right. And so I start thinking through the subscription economy index. And the first thing that come to mind, because you guys always publish, oh, look, subscription companies are growing 20 times faster than traditional companies. I don't Not know what the number is. that much. But. What's, what's, <laughs> what's the number? So I could use the right number. Uh, I have to check the latest. I think the long-term average is around five times faster. Good, good enough, right? Good enough. And so, uh, so we always publish that and I always have to step back and say, okay, now is that real? Does that make sense to me? And, uh, and, and so in my mind, what I think is it may be that the customers that you have data for are the ones that are well run and growing well. And the companies who, who don't use Zora probably don't do as well or they're suffering or struggling. And so maybe they're not growing as quickly. So that was, that was my one capture of the possible bias there. Yeah, no, I think there could be a certain degree of survivor bias. Uh, although we keep failing companies, you know, in the index as they fail, as long as they're, so there's not, there's no survivor bias that, you know, that I put into it. 
But it is true that, I mean, Zora is a sort of a premium product for what it does. And if a company is not well managed or not doing well, you know, one of the things they might do is cut from Zora and use a cheaper billing platform. Yep. So there's a, there's a fair uh, line of reasoning there. Yeah. So, so the next thing I want uh, on that topic, I am so interested in seeing the results after the coronavirus pandemic ends, because I will bet you the subscription companies survive this so much better than traditional companies do. That's kind of what we're expecting. I, I mean, I don't want to gloat or be, you know, triumphal about bad news for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I, I haven't, you know, we run the, I run the, the data on calendar quarters. So, you know, Q1 just finished and I can, you know, I could start updating that data now. I haven't done it yet, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, I'm even wondering if we'll see much impact in Q1 because in the, you know, Western economies, it, it only really hit in the, the end of Q1. And <laughs> at least for a lot of B2B companies, I think, you know, January is when the deals were closing. Um, and yeah, consumer products, yeah, there, you know, there might be a spike in, in March, but so it'll, it'll take some time to see, but absolutely. Yeah, it'll be interesting. interesting. And that's one of the big advantages of companies going subscription is I think it's more recession proof or downturn proof because, you know, it's hard to call this a recession, although technically it is. It's not caused by economic factors. Yeah, I mean, well, of course, there's no such thing as recession proof because, yes. you know, eventually... Uh, I mean, I, I, I have some experience with this, actually, because the Wall Street company where I worked was actually an analytics provider. Uh, and so they were actually, they didn't call it a SaaS product, but it, it was essentially a SaaS product. And so we went through the, the last downturn. And when it first hit, you know, of course, everyone was locked into multi-year contracts. And so, yeah, it didn't really didn't move the needle in the beginning, but then when those contracts came up and the recession was still going on, that's when, you know, <laughs> so subscription companies were, are probably definitely delayed in their response to a recession. Yeah, it'll hit them, if it continues for a long time, it'll certainly affect them. Uh, but I think that their downturn is gonna be much slower or much less dramatic than traditional companies where a lot of times you can just cut the spigot off. I'm not buying that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and some subscription companies are probably seeing boom times because if it's a product that people can enjoy and consume more of when they're confined to their home, then you know demand is, is supposed to be through the roof right now, and they're struggling to keep up. That's what they're saying at Facebook and, of course, Zoom Video that we're recording this conversation on. Yep, and uh, Netflix. I would jump them, pile them in there too. They're probably skyrocketing right now. Oh, and I've noticed some Netflix freezes in the last couple of weeks that, you know, you didn't normally have. You have to be a little patient with Netflix now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, there's, a prop, there's a bandwidth problem in the whole industry right now. So let's, uh, let's switch topics to probably the thing that you really want to talk about the most. And that's your new book that's coming out. Uh, so you've got this book called Fighting Churn with Data. Uh, it's supposed to come out in August. I uh, love the title. And I have all these different ideas just based on the title. But tell me what the book is actually about before we jump into that. <laughs> um, the book is about, well, the, the context is a subscription company mainly, although it could also be any company with recurring usage. And, you know, you're, we're, if you're making your money from your users coming back, then you have the problem of churn. And for any listener who doesn't know, churn means people canceling their subscription. Uh, the term originated with the churn rate, which came out of the telecommunications industry. I mean, the idea being if you lose, say, 1% of your customers every month, you have to replace them every month to keep growing. And you want to more than replace them, of course. So you have this turnover. They called it the churn rate. And now churn is like a noun and a verb. Like we say, oh, that customer is a churn. You know, make a, make a report of last quarter's churns. And, you know, even, oh, I turned from Netflix last month because they finished, you know, the last season of blah, blah, you know. Right. <laughs> anyway, so fighting churn with data is assuming you're a company with repeat users. 
uh, it's for actual programmers and data scientists on how to analyze churn data. Um, Cause typically a company in the, you know, in the subscription economy or the online economy is, is tracking what users do on the product. Um, and this isn't like stalking people on the internet. This is actually, you know, really measuring the plumbing of your own product, right? You need to measure what users are doing what if you're gonna make the product better. So the book teaches people how to use the data around churn in particular as like a survey of your users. Basically the users vote with their feet. You look who stays and who goes. Those are the churns and the, the retained customers. And the book teaches you how to analyze that for the insights that you can bring back to the business. And, and so what's unique about analyzing churn? Well, a few things in comparison to other data science problems. The biggest difference with most data science problems is actually that I don't emphasize machine learning and AI prediction in this area. Because the thing about churn is there's no one solution. If you think a customer is going to leave, the next question is why? And there are many reasons a customer could be leaving. It could be they're not using it at all, or it could be they're using the product in some negative or contrary way, or they had unmet expectations about it, or it could be that they signed up for the premier plan, but they're not using it enough to justify. Um, it could be that they didn't, they don't understand it. You know, they don't know how to use it and they need training. So because there's no one size fits all solution to churn, you actually have to understand the customers rather than just use an AI algorithm. Um, so the f emphasis of the book is actually on creating customer metrics uh, that the business users who have to, you know, reduce churn can actually understand. Yeah, so I can imagine, so in my mind, but first off, let me say, that's not what I thought the book was about, believe it or not. I actually thought the book was going to tell me how um, many, many examples of companies that have identified churn using data and how to solve that. There are case studies, and there are a couple of case that, uh, mm -hmm. companies who are Zora customers that appear throughout the book. Um, showing you, yeah, this is what the real results looked like. This is what a real yep. company found you know, yep. when they so, did this. So I think that makes a lot of sense then to teach me how to do that. And what I'm, what I'm imagining this looking like is I've got, uh, I'm gonna look at December's churn. And so I had 1% churn in December. That means I had 99% non-churn in December. So I'm trying to compare the 1% of people who did churn to the 99% who didn't. And to do that, I have to go back to November and October and September and look at the behaviors of those customers over that time frame mm -hmm. to figure out or be able to say these are the ones who, these were the behaviors of the people who churned that was different than the behaviors of people who didn't churn. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if the way you've said it, I mean, well, I don't know how technical are your usual listeners <laughs> for your podcast. Let's go for it. We'll try to simplify it in a second. I, I want to hear the details. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I mean, what you just described is basically what is taught in the book is how to make you make a data set from observations of past times when people stayed or left. And the, the big element that you were alluding to is the calculation of the customer metrics, because that's what tells you what has this person been doing for the past month or the past three months or whatever it is. And so are you teaching the customer metrics? These are the right metrics to be watching for? I teach a system for designing and exploring customer metrics. And it's really, if there's a, you know, the subtitle of the book could be like the science of customer metrics. It's not quite going to be that. They have a subtitle, something along those lines. But because there, there is no one size fits all solution for the customer metrics. It depends on what data you're collecting. It depends crucially on what are the value creating activities of your product and how closely can you measure them? Because in some companies, the value creating activity is very easy to measure. And in some companies, it's intangible. Like your enjoyment of a streaming video is intangible. And the company that's hopefully trying to stop you from churning will have limited information 
to work from. They can look at what you watched. They can look at what percent you completed. If you actually liked or shared something, then that would be like a real treasure of information. But most people don't even bother with that. Yep. So then there's other companies. If you think of like a CRM um, or a Azora kind of a billing product, the, comp the user of the product is generating financial value. And it's actually very easy to measure the value that the customer generates using your product. So there, there's a whole range of situations. But the amazing thing is actually the techniques in my book apply across the board. So it's kind of like a, a framework for thinking about metrics and designing them. Yeah. So let me flip this upside down for just a second so I could use another set of words. And then I want you, you to give me those words for this circumstance. And so a lot of data scientists today are focused on how do I convert leads to customers? And so we do that by looking at a buyer's journey and we model, we assume that buyers are going to go through this step. First I have to be, you know, there's the many different models, but I have to know that it exists. I have to, to like it. I have to evaluate it. I have to. And so the data scientists or whoever it is that's working with them is creating a behavioral model of how they expect buyers to behave. Now let's flip that upside down and say, you have to be doing almost the exact same thing, but it's how I expect users to stay, right? What's, what's the words that I'm looking it's, for? Uh, it's how you expect <laughs> users to generate value or to experience value, you know, from using the product. And you're right. It's the exact opposite. There is some difference though. And I'll tell you, I mean, the first one that comes to mind and I often, you know, discuss this with people is that from the buyer's journey, you're more, people are more thinking about sequences of actions. Um, like, and they're concerned, uh, you know, about what order they might go through a website or, you know, read certain content, you know, once the person signed up, cause this is a recurring usage situation. I tell people to just focus on the aggregate statistics, like how much are they doing things and not so much the order. Um, people often ask me like, oh, what, what do you think about the word, the final moments or, you know, I don't usually think about the final moments, honestly, because this is in a way just based on my own subjective experience. Uh, when you get value from something, it's a process that occurs over time. And if you're not getting value from a product, it's usually also a process that occurs over time. It's not like one bad experience will make you cancel. Um, but for sure, a sequence of suboptimal experiences without enough really good experiences over time, that'll, that is what will make you cancel. And so usually in the churn scenario, the straw that breaks the camel's back is it's just another piece of straw. You know, you have to look at the whole journey, the whole aggregate of what they've been doing to see where they got value or failed to get value. Yeah. So it's hard to say like a buyer's journey that it's step by step by step. It's more of a, a gradual, we're now not getting the value we used to get. So, okay. Now love this, but here's what I want you to do next. And I'm, I wouldn't surprise you if you do this. <laughs> Once I can predict how much value somebody's getting from my product based on their usage patterns and what and how they're, well, I guess we'll just say usage patterns. Now I should be able to say to my sales team, these are the people you want to go call on because they're about to upgrade or they're ripe to upgrade to the next level or they need to get more usage going. And if we guided them, we could get them. So we throw it to the customer success department. Are we doing that as well? Yep. That's pretty much the idea. Um, the, the book doesn't go into the details of how to run a customer success team or also, you know, there's going to be a marketing component too. You might start with what they would call an engagement campaign where you're marketing to your existing customers with useful tips and information. I'm sure you've gotten some of those. So, but, so the book is basically gives you all the, all the data those people need uh, to, you know, do their thing, but I don't go into like how you design an email campaign or, you know, run a right. customer success right. desk. Cause I speak from my own experience. I've never, I've never run a, a customer success department. I've talked to many heads of customer success departments, but I've never been one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So I want to rename your book, by the way, you don't have to rename it, but I want to rename your book 
how to determine how much value users are getting from our product. That is really the essence of it. Um, I think fighting churn with data is a little catchier. So I I'll, think so I'll, too. I'll probably <laughs> stick with that. But it, it really is the essence of the book. I mean, because I, I emphasize that very early on that the, there's no gimmicks or tricks with churn. Um, because the people who are already using your product, they know, you know, they know what it's like. So if you want to reduce churn in a meaningful way, you have to give people more value. Yep. Yeah, I love that. And the reason I wanted to rewrite your title, at least for me and my audience, is because value has everything to do with pricing. So that fits us perfectly. Okay, we are so far over time, but you promised me that you had a, a contrarian view on data science that I absolutely have to hear before we uh, shut this down. So let's hear it. <laughs> uh, well, I think I already threw it out there, at least with churn, where I say, you know, save the AI for later mm. and just focus on actually using your own brain and understanding your customers. So that's kind of contrarian and it definitely makes it harder to sell a book like this because most of the conferences are looking for, oh, what new buzzwords and technology are, are you you know, promoting. And I'm like, well, little SQL, Python, maybe a regression. <laughs> oh, man. So, so I just did, I do these little videos. And I just did this little video the other day on um, how I get this feeling that companies are so focused on data now that they forget to go out and actually talk to their marketplace, actually listen to people. And, and I think you're kind of in the middle. So if I were to go AI and machine learning, it's like, oh, I don't even want to think about how people think. Now you're saying, I want to think about how people think. Let's use the data to figure it out. And I think we also need to make sure that we're out talking to people who just churned out and figuring out why the heck they churned out. And are we representing that in the models we're trying to test for um, in, in the churn models? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I wouldn't at all say you shouldn't talk to your customers. <laughs> I'm with um, you. <laughs> I mean, I, I do say at some point in the book that, you know, this churn data, it's like a survey that you don't have to ask people, you yep. know, and that everyone answers. Every time they renew or churn, everyone answers this survey. Um, it just takes, a, because it just takes a little more, you know, technical expertise to read the results out because you have to, well, it's kind of all in the book, um, yep. you know, the awesome. design of the metrics and everything. Awesome. Carl, I have enjoyed this so much. Thank you. Uh, but I have to end. I'm going to ask you the trick question, especially since you're not in pricing. Uh, do you have one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Um, sure. I mean, I have probably have a few, but I'll have one that I would give is really straight out of the book. One of the most valuable metrics that you can ever make of, for a, a subscription business is the recurring unit cost that the customer pays. So if you take just the price that they pay per month or year or what have you, and divide it by whatever important activity, say it's like videos watched, you know, so it's like your dollars per video or your dollars per whatever it is, that metric for your service is one of the most important churn and retention indicators and will give you, you know, amazing insight into the value uh, that customers are getting. Nice. So you could almost argue that as a dollar per value and whatever that value is or however that customer measures the value they get from our product. Yeah, exactly. Only it, the act might not be the direct value, but you want the act, the, the act to be as close as you can get. Yeah. Nice. Carl, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, my website, which is fightshurnwithdata.com. Um, and that has information about the book, you know, my social media contact also at Carl 24 K on Twitter. All right. Thank you so much. Episode 67, all finished. Let's see, my favorite part. Am I allowed to say everything was my favorite part of today's uh, podcast? I absolutely oh, I don't know. Well, that'd be nice. <laughs> I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun uh, geeking out and thinking about the models. Uh, so what was your favorite part? Please let us know in the comments of wherever you downloaded and listened. While you're at it, would you please give us a five-star review? They're very valuable to us. Don't forget, we have that free community at community.championsofvalue.com where you'll see all of the things that we publish and have great conversations there. 
If you have questions or comments about the podcast or about pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. <laughs>